Okay. All right. Thank you, Jennifer Angus, for being here with me today. Jenny, <laughs> and you're a professor in the design studies department at University of Wisconsin-Madison. You have your art displayed across the world in Canada and Germany, Japan, Spain, all these different places. And you've also won multiple awards. And I think the most interesting part about the, about your art and it's also the reason that you know, I work at Mighty Cricket and I wanted to reach out to you and talk to you is that your art is created by using insects and they're real and you keep their natural color, reuse them from exhibit to exhibit. And my first question is what inspired you um, to look at an insect and think, I'm going to make this into art? Yeah, that's a really good question because, you know, uh, when I was an undergraduate studying art, I would have never expected that insects would become my medium. In fact, what I did study was textiles. Um, and more from a, an art perspective as opposed to a design perspective, but design, textile design is what I teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So it was at a time in kind of the mid 80s where I was actually doing research on tribal minority dress in Northern Thailand in that area that's known as the Golden Triangle where the borders of Thailand, Laos and Myanmar meet up. And within that region, there are many different minority groups. And I was uh, essentially researching and photo documenting tribal dress. And I came upon a garment, it's a shawl that comes from the Karen, Karen like the girl's name, um, Karen tribe. And on the fringe of the shawl were strung green metallic beetle wings. And I, I don't know, I, I, I grew up in Canada and other than butterflies, I had yeah. never thought of insects as being beautiful. And I never realized that these metallic looking insects existed at all. I was just captivated. And I always say I have magpie tendencies. I like shiny things. So I became pretty obsessed with them. And since textile design is my area, another thing that's important to me is pattern. And I found myself just getting more and more interested in the insects, yet pattern is my first love. And then one day I had that aha moment where I thought, okay, I'm going to take the insects and I'm gonna put them in patterns. And when I was actually talking to a friend of mine, Sarah Quinton, who's the um, chief curator at the Textile Museum of Canada, and I was telling her about this idea and something, I don't know what she heard, but she repeated back to me, yeah, putting the insects on, in patterns on the wall is a great idea. And I went, huh. what? <laughs> 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 and, and so that was the, the first show. Uh, and it, it, was, it took me a while to have enough at the time, that very first show, it had one wall that was 18 feet long and the it was just an L shape. The other wall was nine feet and it was a major undertaking. And this was just a gut feeling that this would be interesting, uh, but I didn't know why, which is, you know, as certainly anyone who's, who's been to graduate school knows they're always asked, why, why are you doing that? And I didn't know why I was a gut feeling, but as soon as I did it, I knew why, because of the reactions, because people from a distance, the insects really flatten out. And I heard people saying, well, I see they put up a new wallpaper, but I don't see the art. And they would walk into the gallery and I would watch them walk up to the wall and then literally take a step back as they <laughs> realized that that pattern was formed with insects. And I realized, ah, I get it. People think they know what they're seeing. And this pattern is suggesting a home, a domestic space. But for the most part, the average person does not want insects in their house. So there was kind of a compulsion to come towards the wall and then a repulsion as people <laughs> stepped back. So there was this tension. 
So, you know, I always say I came to insects through my love of textiles and my interest in textiles. So it's, it's a bit of an unusual path. I am an artist, I'm not an entomologist. I'm an artist who has over the years learned a fair amount about insects. Right, right. Yeah, one fall, the other. And I think you're definitely right because there's something about insects. It's, they're, they're so intricate and beautiful. And especially over here, like in, in the West, just like Western countries, we assume we see a bug and we're like, you know, I want to kill that thing or get away from it as fast as possible. And it's really funny to have people be like, that's so beautiful. What is it? And then when they get close, they're like, when they realize what it is, they kind of all their like biases kind of come out and are like, oh, I actually don't like this. It's weird. Exactly. exactly. But, and one of the things I've really tried to do with my work is to introduce people to insects that they may not have thought of as being beautiful before. So I don't use butterflies in part because of the reason I just stated, but also they don't stand up to the wear and tear of reuse. So some of my insects, those weevils that I first started out with in the show I described, I'm still using today. They've held up over 20 years. So it's pretty amazing. Wow, that is amazing. When you reuse the bug, do you, do you like how do you preserve that? Is there a process? Well, they're simply dead and dried. And so <laughs> when they are not in with an entomological pin through their body, so when they're not on display, they're on foam boards in storage boxes, according to species with an airtight lid, sometimes um, mothballs, naphthalene in there. Uh, and I only show in climate controlled spaces. So, you know, no summer shows in hot right. humid places, uh, but that's all there is to it. And certainly more, not so much the installation of the work, but it happens more frequently frequently with the takedown. The insects are just pinned to the wall with their pin, typically into drywall. And so sometimes you have to sort of wriggle the pin to, to get it out. And sometimes there's some damage then. And if there is, then I do my best to repair it. And I put the not so great specimens high up or low down, keep the best ones at eye level. <laughs> Uh, and no one is is the wiser. And so that's how you keep them going for so long. Right. Yeah. Well, I love that. Keeping because at Mighty Cricket, you know, we love how sustainable crickets are. I mean, reuse, reduce, recycle, <laughs> even in art. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 a more certainly a moral um, situation where it is the right thing to to reuse them. But also financially, it would be some the, probably the most expensive I use in quantity is $20 a piece. I'm not going to just throw that out. It's just not no. financially viable. But, no. you know, in terms of sustainability, of course, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, financially sustainable, environmentally sustainable, double whammy. Exactly. <laughs> So when you're creating these, you know, these designs, these patterns, where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I do what's called site-specific installation, which means that the exhibition is designed for the space. So um, sometimes uh, a museum or gallery is located in a historic building. So I like to know something about the history of the space. I mean, sometimes they've even been uh, you know, houses. So who were the people? Um, other times it's modern gallery, it's a white box, but I have been asked to consider, you know, the community um, that supports the uh, institution and, and doing something that reflects them. But other times um, it's just, you know, what I want to experiment with. And I think that that's a goal of every exhibition is that I want to learn something new and that I find something exciting. And then I want to follow, you know, sort of expand upon that uh, for, for the next show. Uh, so I'm always working with the floor plan. I know the dimensions of, of the space. I, over the years, the insects I've learned do certain things really well. Right. <laughs> they do circles well, they do diamonds well, they do squiggly lines well. Um, I can, with the smaller insects, such as the weevils, almost treat it like beadwork and make recognizable um, images, such as the skull is one that I frequently used. 
Uh, so to some degree, the insects themselves dictate what, what I do, but you can always interchange and create combinations. Um, right, that right, I yeah. I haven't done before. Yeah, you don't really think about that, but each, in, in, each insect is like a piece of art itself and you're kind of, you know, fixing it all together to make one larger art piece. That's Very really much so. One uh, an assistant, he, he was interviewed for something and he described them as pixels. That when you work with them so often, uh, you know, of course the ooh factor is gone. To him, they were just pixels to be placed. And I thought that that was an interesting way to think of them. Yeah, that definitely is. And when you're using these bugs and insects as your medium for your artwork, what are you communicating by using these bugs? Is it like a deeper message or? Absolutely. I mean, there's there's a few things. I mean, I would say the number one thing, and perhaps we're feeling this even more so as we come out of our COVID isolation, is is that people are venturing out, and I would really like them to walk into the space and go, "Wow, mm -hmm. just simply wow." <laughs> and then a lot of people follow that up with, "I've never seen anything like this before." And I think that we don't have very many wow moments. Uh, I, I mean, I think back to childhood where every day there was something right. cool. And then as adults, uh, we're busy and especially in the internet age, I mean, if I don't know something, I do a Google search and all of a sudden I'm sort of an instant expert that we are very rarely amazed. So I think that wonder, that wow factor is important to me uh, to just kind of transport people. And again, particularly after COVID that we all have wanted to live in another world. <laughs> uh, and so creating this, this kind of otherworldly space has been important to me. But I would say the other thing I would like is to, for people to leave and think about insects differently. You know, so as you described, you know, not when they see an insect necessarily think, oh, I got to get out the fly swatter, or I got even worse, right. get out the raid, that yeah. perhaps you can usher it out the door. And I just, I like, I'm no big lover of flies, but you know, there's a particular time of year that all of a sudden there are these flies on my windowsill. And I had very successfully been putting a glass over them and slipping a piece of paper uh, under them and then taking them outside. And I often think, well, you know, who was here first, really? They probably have as much right to be here as myself. So, you know, thinking about insects differently, perhaps thinking about their role in the environment. And I'm not sure that this necessarily comes from an initial viewing, but perhaps thinking about it further, you know, we all are no bees as pollinators, but there are other insects that are pollinators. Uh, we need them to decompose matter. But I think ultimately their most important job is an integral part of the food chain. So when people say, oh, I'm not seeing as many birds around, is it because there are fewer insects around? And why are there fewer insects around? It's because of urban, suburban sprawl, climate change, pesticides. So I think it's a great kind of gateway to really talk about environmental issues in a holistic way. Yeah, I 100% agree. And like you were saying before, you know, as a kid, everything you see is new because you're constantly learning. And I think insects is something that as a child, we're like, you know, we're kind of told, oh, this isn't something that we learn about. And then when you go into this room filled with beautiful insects, you're immediately drawn to it because you're like, this is something I've been told my kind of my whole life not to really go near and I don't really want to go near it. But now I'm here in this room and I have and I see it for what it is. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think, too, is that a lot of people are afraid of insects. So yeah. first off, these insects are not alive. But one thing I've observed is, is that putting them into patterns is kind of asserting control and hasn't right. isn't what man has always sought to do control mother nature and people are more disturbed when I have them in a quote swarm like pattern <laughs> as they imagine that that's what they'd really be doing so creating order out of you know the chaos of nature also seems to put people at ease in terms of dealing with their insect phobia <laughs> 
Wow, that's really interesting. See, yeah, because that's so true. I mean, humans, we everything we build is to create some kind of order. And then yeah. you see a swarm of flies and you're like, there's nothing I can do to, to <laughs> yeah. stop that. It's coming at me no matter what. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so I also wanted to talk about your new exhibition, which opened in Staten Island, uh, the Staten Island Museum, July 9th. And it's called Magic Cicada, Mag- Magic Cicada. Cicada. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that comes from the term that William T. Davis, who is uh, one of the founders of the museum more than a hundred years ago. He was, a, he was an entomologist and he specialized in c- cicadas and Magic Cicada is the name that he coined for the periodical cicadas, the ones that uh, emerge every 13 or 17 years. And you know what, There's, it's so appropriate, appropriate. I had never experienced Uh, an emergence of a brood myself until this spring. And I went to the Princeton area uh, to to see that. And the weather wasn't terrific, but nonetheless, I feel like it was one of the most incredible sights I've ever seen. And I will always remember it, just so many cicadas. And I had one day of good weather and then it got, we had that, um, you know, sort of cold rainy period. And it really took the cicadas kind of by surprise. And I was picking them up off the ground because I was collecting, but I had made the decision I would only pick up um, those that were recently deceased. But I picked them up and then see that their their legs were moving. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna put you on a branch and get you to where you were going. And then I started to feel like a matchmaker. I swear to God, on <laughs> one tree, I picked up about 30 and I was like, okay, I'm going to put you with you and you with you, you know, try to create these love connections. Um, but so back to the title of the exhibition. So William T. Davis, one of the founders of the museum, uh, who was a cicada specialist. In fact, the museum has the second largest collection of cicadas in the world. And then the emergence of Brood 10, otherwise known as Brood X, it was kind of a perfect time to create an exhibition that really celebrated the cicada. Right, yeah, amazing. And also love being a matchmaker. I can't believe (laughs) single-handedly saving the cicadas. Jennifer (laughs) Angus, thank you, our hero. (laughs) (laughs) Just a very tiny part when you think I just described 30 and what, you know, the prediction was that two billion or something would come out. Yeah, there's a few. Also (laughs) definitely feel good about myself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you did your good deed of the debt. Also, I can't just going up to to live bugs and picking them up. Oh my gosh. Wow. That is, they were very non-threatening. You know, I did, I had brought with me one of those kind of mosquito hats because, you know, things I'd read in the past where they're just all over you. And as you can see, I have long hair and I was like, I am not going to be happy if they're stuck in my hair, but due to the weather, it was really totally unnecessary. And yeah, they did fly on my head or, you know, land on my clothing occasionally, but it was no no big deal. I think that part of being the so-called insect lady is that I have, it, you know, when I've traveled a lot of times, people, oh, you're interested in insects and then put some live thing in my hand. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, I have to live up to my names and not go, ah! <laughs> because it does, admittedly, it does feel strange that they have, you know, they have these little sort of claws or barbs on their feet and you and you do feel that but I these cicadas I just I think they look cute to their faces and of course the you know that you probably heard that um, there's this fungus that's going around and like five percent of the population uh, cicada periodical cicada um, population is affected by this fungus which is unfortunately killing them off. I'm not going to go into the details of what yeah. it does. It's pretty unpleasant. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, uh, it's, it's a shame. And I feel like they're such wonderful creatures. I, I spent some time in Japan and in Japan, people love the sound of cicadas. To them, that's the sound of summer. And so I really wish that uh, our attitudes were, were quite different to insects. Yeah, I definitely agree. 
and I, I actually, I didn't hear about that fungus, but that is, that is devastating to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and in this exhibit, could you maybe like describe a little bit just so we can get, get a visual idea of what's going yeah. on? Well, I think that the thing that will most strike people is the color of the room. It's kind of a mauvey pink color. And that color is actually derived from an insect. The insect is lac, it's a scale insect and shellac is produced from it. So this insect produces a resin and I was familiar with it since I teach textile design, we use lac as a natural dye to produce this pink mauvey color. And I had previously used cochineal, another scale insect uh, to color walls. And that's a much more bright magenta color. So with this, we uh, infused white paint first with a lac concentrate, and then we put a glaze that was also lac infused upon the walls. So that pink color is part of the story that it is an insect colorant. And then the lighting in the gallery, it's entirely lit by chandeliers, six chandeliers. Uh, so it's a very kind of ethereal, airy space. There are also 11 windows. And again, since I teach textile design, I screen printed the curtains. It's a white on white print that shows the periodical cicada emergence. And depending on the light, you may, the design kind of disappears or appears. Along the perimeter of the walls are shelves that hold drawers from a cabinet of curiosities that is 170 drawers. This thing is 11 feet high. And it was always frustrating to me that of course, after row 70, people couldn't see up. And so my solution to this was to create these shelves. So now people get the opportunity to see uh, inside the drawers, which are often their, their own little scenes in which I've anthropomorphized insects and they're doing you know very everyday activities. And to some degree, they're a reflection of me in that I'm a professor. So sometimes they're teaching or they're doing textile activities. But I really saw that as another way to gain empathy for insects. I call myself the insect ally. That if we can think of insects as, you know, perhaps leading lives parallel to our own, that we wouldn't be quite so fast to stomp them. Uh, in addition to the shelves, there's also what I call my insect jelly. And I have made jelly and suspended insects in them. And I, within the shelves that are in front of the window, so it looks very stained glass like. I've also used jars from the museum's wet collection, so things in alcohol. So those are mixed in. And then in addition to that, there are seven cases in the center of the room, which again are more of these worlds in which I explore, say, honey and beeswax. Um, in, so insect products, uh, another case kind of devoted to thinking about uh, the decomposition that we need insects to do. And I say these, these are not didactic, they are definitely poetic in nature. And then of course, there's the big cabinet with 170 holes, drawers, but I've used where I've got the drawers out. There's um, taxidermy from the museum's collection and specifically choosing in uh, those animals that would eat insects. And finally, I'll talk about the uh, one more cabinet that has drawers. And I asked my friend, Joseph Yoon, who I'm sure you know, is a chef who cooks with insects. Yeah. And Joseph was invited to do four drawers, um, really about edible insects, which is his specialty. And then another two drawers are done my, by myself and another two uh, by Colleen Evans, who is the director of science. So she really looked to the uh, museum's uh, historic collection, specifically of cicadas. Um, mine is more, I did have one drawer that was periodical cicadas and another was the sort of insects, uh, cicadas in patterns. But I think having Joseph's work there is such a great opportunity. I really love to look at things holistically and we can look at the beauty of insects 
But from a teaching perspective, you know, this is the only continent where people seem to have this aversion to eating insects. And, you know, is it the food of the future? Is it the superfood? Um, these, right. these are great things to talk about. And I think um, this is, again, a gateway to get that conversation going. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what Mighty Cricket is trying to do. You know, it is the food of the future. We're trying to get people to, you know, learn more about insects. And I think that's also why I was so compelled with your artwork. And I was like, this is a perfect way to get people to understand, hey, hey, look, here's this bug, like you said, teaching and really kind of humanize them in a way, yeah. um, especially in the West, because 2 billion people or more, you know, eat insects across the world. It's just over here. It doesn't really happen as much. And there's a lot of ingrained bias. And I think that's great that the work that you're doing is, is fighting against that ultimate yeah. ally of the insects and yeah, matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that was my last question. I, I know you have to go, but I just want to say thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Um, and if, for, if people did, I just want to throw in, if people did want to check out your work on, on that museum, I found it on the Staten Island Museum website. And it was yes. really beautiful when I, like the, the pink, I was like that, I think that might be my favorite color. And it comes from <laughs> a, an insect. So that is yeah. so cool. Yeah. And the exhibition will be up until May 22. Um, and for, let's see, I'm just thinking of other places. I have work at the Barry Art Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. That'll be up till uh, the first week in August. And for those people, I'm coming to you from Wisconsin. I have work at the Museum of Wisconsin Art in West Bend. And that's gonna be up for a little while longer, certainly till the end of summer. So lots right. of chances. To Amazing, see. yeah. Lots of chances to check it out. Yeah, yeah. And on my Instagram, Insect Girl, the girl is with a U. Um, yes. You can see what I'm up to most days. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. All yeah. right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you.